Good morning. You know, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, you, you don't realize how much it means to you, not you, but me, uh, to do it. Because you know, when, when, you, when you begin to share these things, you, you get to reaffirm them in your own heart, in your own life. Because, I mean, it's, it's very meaningful to know what God wants for you and how he wants to, you to walk. And, and today I, I'm going to share about being a ready listener and also the threshing floors of your life. You know, and you get to understand that a little better as I go through it, but the ready listener was something I cannot say that I ever was, you know, initially in my life. You know, I, I already knew, you know, and so many of you are out there, you're, you're the same way. You know, if you know that it's very difficult, or if you think, you, I should say, if you think you know, uh, it's very difficult then to be listening because you're already anticipating what you're going to say back and you already have done so many, uh, you know, things in your own mind and figured it all out. But in James 1.19, it says, Understand this, my brethren, let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and slow to get angry. And that's what we're talking about today, a ready listener. How do you become a ready listener? You know, you can't, you can't talk about being a ready listener without reading also John 5.30. I mean, it is the that's the foundation of our church. It's what our main, uh, you know, strength and belief really is. It says, it's Jesus talking. He says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord. But as I am taught by God and as I get his orders, here it is, even as I hear, I judge, I decide as I am bidden to decide as the voice comes to me see the voice comes to me a ready listener so i give a decision my judgment is right just righteous because i do not seek my own counsel my own will i have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself my own aim my own purpose but only the will and the pleasure of the father who sent me boy if we could really be in the midst of, if that was totally our lives. But that's where God wants us to go to. He, he wants us to be a ready listener. You know, he, he wants us to be not pleasing ourselves, not after our own aim, not after our own purpose, but he wants us only to be after the will of God in, in, in our lives. But so many people that because they think they know, they think they understand. In Jeremiah, he talks about the uh, the Israelites, you know, and he says, yet they would not listen. They weren't ready listeners, he said, and obey or even incline their ears. But they stiffened their necks that they might not hear and might not receive instruction. You know, I know in my life, you know, so much of that rebellion and so many of those things that I did, you know, when when someone of any, you know, knowledge or someone any authority in my life would come, that neck, you know, I never understood initially, but that neck would stiffen. You know, I mean, literally, you would be there and you would, you know, even a little baby, you, you look at a little baby, when a little baby is in its rebellion, what does it do? It arches its back and stiffens itself up, you know, and, and, and that's where we've been. You know, we, we stay, and that's where the Israelites were. They wouldn't even listen. You know what? That they might receive, that they might not receive, and they didn't want to hear the instruction. And it says also in Jeremiah 13, 10, it says, These evil people who refuse to hear my words, who walk in stubbornness of their hearts, and have gotten all their other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be like a girdle or a waist cloth, which is profitable for nothing. You know, in those days, no different than now. In those days, wearing a certain girdle or a cloth around, 
around your midsection. You know, it was more of a sign of who they were and all that, but it really had no purpose. And that's what he's saying. See, going after all those other gods, doing all those other things, it has absolutely no purpose in your life. And what does it do? That stubbornness refuses then to hear the words of God. You're not, an, you're not a readily, ready listener. You're not listening at all. You're into all the things that, you know, are, are in the world. You're doing all the things that are around you. You know, it's, it, it's interesting when you're, when you're, when you're in that position. Uh, you always fight to have the last word. You're not even hearing what the person's saying because you're ready to pounce on them at the very end and say what you're going to say. And he may have said all these different things and you didn't hear it. Or, or, or you, you try to be, where I was taught very strongly, especially as a, a, a business person, is how to step on the other person's words. You know, he's talking and talking and there's no way to get in. You think there's no way to get in and pretty soon you just, I'm going in. You're not listening. You're just seeing how you can get by, how you can establish what you have in your heart. You know, you also, there's the, the fight to be right. You know, you again, you're not listening. All you care about is you want to be right. You want what you know to be true. You know, uh, you don't seek truth. You just want to be right and you want to do. It. But above all, you need to hear what's being said. You need to be a ready listener. You know, in that stiff-necked uh, hardness of heart, you need to learn how to break up the fallow ground. And the fallow ground is, is dry and full of ruts. It's, uh, it, it wasn't always this way. It once produced fruit. And through neglect, it became fallow. And that's our heart. That's our lives. You know, we, you know, at one point, you know, we were trying to do right. But yet, that hardness of heart begins to set in as we begin to go after our idols, as we begin to be stubborn, as we begin to allow that stiffened neck not to hear, you know, what is being said to us. It says in Hosea 10, 12, he says, So for yourselves according to righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God. Reap according to mercy and loving kindness. Break up your uncultivated ground, that hard, fallow ground. For it's time to seek God, to inquire for him, and to require his favor, till he comes and teaches you righteousness and rains his righteous gift of salvation upon you. It's t it says it. It's time to, what? Inquire of him. And when you're inquiring of him, you're hearing. You're, you're a ready listener. You know, and you're breaking up that ground, that ground that's become fallow because of all the things that you chose to do were the not God. That's why you're sowing to yourself according to righteousness. You're not sowing yourself, you know, in, in, in the, what the world wants you to do and what you know, it, what the wickedness of life is. He says further in Jeremiah, he says, for thus says the Lord to the men of Judah, to of, to of Israel, break up your ground that was left uncultivated for a season so you may not sow among thorns. That's what, that's what I'm saying. So you're not sowing it. He says, break off your evil ways. He says, repent of your sins, cease to do evil, and then the good seed of the word will have room to grow and bear fruit. You got to stop going to the world for all the things that you want and desires. That worldly pleasure is only for a season. And then it becomes the hardness of life. And then it becomes the torment. And then you're not serving God and you're not having that, that grace of God in your life. You're not having his mercy. You, you know, you, you, you're, you're in that pleasure of the world. And the next thing you destroy it because that's the devil's plan. He wants to steal the gift of God. He wants to take it. He wants to harden it. He wants to keep it from coming forth. Proverbs 15, 7 says this. He says, the lips of the wise dispense knowledge, sifting it as chaff from the grain, not so the minds and hearts of the self-confident and foolish. 
You know, so many times in the Bible, God, God gives us really clear understanding through simple things, you know, and, and he, he shows them as, as examples. And in this particular case, he, you know, it becomes a major example, and it's going to get further in the other things I'm going to say. But we're talking about, you know, threshing, you know, and, and we're talking about the threshing floor. You know, and, and in the threshing process, it's loosening the edible part of the grain. It's taking it. You know, they take it to the threshing floor. After they've reaped the harvest, they bring the grain to the threshing floor, and they put it on the floor. And on the floor, they start stomping on it. They start trying. They're removing the very plant itself. And that's so much what God does in our life. You know, as we begin to come to him, he's removing all those elements. He's taking... He's taking all the things that we've taken on board, and, and he's removing them. And those people are there. They're there. They're beating. They're threshing that grain. They're trying to get the the the, the very heart of what the plan is, the very seed of the grain itself. And that's God. He's trying to get the very person of who we are. You know who I was. You know, forty some years ago. You know, even my own wife said, she said, I doubt I would have liked you very much. And, you know, truthfully, that would have been true because there's very few people, I mean, would have liked me very much back then. I was not a nice, nice person. You know, I, I was for myself, you know, and I did everything that way. You know, and that's why God, he has to then take us that to that threshing floor and begin to separate those things, take them from our lives. And get to the, the 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 very gift, the thing that's good there. So he, he removes it. He removes the straw, you know. He he removes the weeds. He removes the darnell, you know, those seeds of, you know, of weeds that were planted there, you know. And that's what God. The, the devil comes. He plants all those little darnells in our lives. He plants those, you know, wicked people. To, you know, that grow up with us, that are part of us, you know, and that help lead us in the wrong way. You know, and, and when God gets us to the threshing floor there, is what he's saying. When he gets that plant to the front, the, the, they get that plant to the threat, they take it apart until they get back to there's just seed. But then when there's just seed, the winnowing process starts. You know, and, you know, I can't say I, I really understand farming because, truthfully, I grew up in the middle of the city, you know, and there wasn't a whole lot of farming. There was a lot of concrete. But I begin to, you know, as, as I look at it, I, I understand because you can see it just in, just in the pictures of it or you can see it in understanding and just what it's explaining. But the winnowing process is simple. You know, you have that seed, but yet on that seed, there's still a chaff that's around it. There's still a covering. And that's just like our heart. You know, when we come, yes, he's separating all the things from us. He's taking all the, the uh, uh, you know, the foreign matter from our lives. But yet then we get to the very heart of who we are. And that hardness of heart is still there. And then he goes to work on our heart. And in working on our heart, you know, what he does, he's, he's taking that chaff and he's removing it. He, he's taking it. And that's, how, that's, what, he, that's what he wants to do. He, he wants to take that chaff, and the winnowing uh, of it is is real simple. They have a winnowing fans, they call, and they scoop up that, you know, the the actual seed that's left, you know, that after they get rid of all that other, you know, darnells and the plant itself, they scoop up the seed that's left because all that seed that's left has been also threshed and pounded and done. And what what they do is they scoop it up, they throw it up in the air. And the wind comes. And when the wind comes, it takes that outside shaft and removes it. It's there. And the good seed falls back to the ground. And that's what's kept. And it's just like in our life, that Holy Spirit, he comes. You know, he comes like a wind and he begins to deal with us and remove that outer shell of that seed until we become really the pureness of what God really has made us so that we can then help others see, you know, what it is. Now, David, David's threshing floor, you know, is a very clear picture of what I just got done saying. But in Chronicles 21, 15, 26, you know, he says, 
God sent an angel to Jerusalem. David had sinned. You know, David, David had decided to count the people. And not that counting the people in itself was wrong, but David's motive for counting the people was wrong. You know, and so God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he's destroying it, the Lord beheld, and he regretted and relented of the evil he said to the destroying angels. It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor, because this is where it all occurred. It occurred at David's threshing floor. And that's why I'm talking about the threshing floor, because there's so many threshing floors in our own lives. We come to points where there's more things that need to be dealt with. God takes us to those threshing floors. He begins to do that process, remove that hardness, remove that sin. And that's what's happening with David here. He said, you know, David lifted up his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heavens, having drawn the sword in his hand, stretched out over, over Jerusalem. I mean, this was the angel of death. People were going to die. And it was standing there. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. You know, and, and, and that's us in our lives. We need to be in that place. Sackcloth, you know, when they wore that sackcloth, I mean, that's a, a coarse, you know, piece of cloth that they put on to show, to show God, to show the, the people around them the humility, you know, uh, of, who, you know, what they've done. They're, to say, I, I am repenting for what I'm done. You know, and so they wore it and they fell on their faces. And David said to God, it is not I, is it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? It is I who was, has sinned and done evil. But as these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord, my God, be on me and my father's house but not on your people, that they should be plagued. You know, it's, you know, the, the cry of the heart, you know, it, it stems God. I mean, it's David's cry, that repentance, you know, that God saw. And so much of David, when you see, you read the Psalms, that, that's his cry. It's, he said, God, don't take your spirit from me, you know, you know. You know, remove your enemies from me. You know, he just cries out and he cries out. And that should be us. You know, when we, we come to those places, when we come to those places, those threshing floors where we've seen as David that we haven't done right. You know, because it says, it says in Proverbs, he says, there's a way that seems right to a man and appears straight before him, but the end thereof is death. You know, so many times in our lives, we think we know and we move and we go toward those you know, those areas, and we, we act that way, you know, and we, we become someone we shouldn't be. And yet when we find it, <coughs> that's when we get to that point of that threshing floor. <coughs> Sorry. And that's where we, we get, where we realize that God needs to do that work in us. He needs to separate. He needs to take away those things. Second Samuel 24, 2 said, for the king said to Joab, the captain of the host who was with him, go now through the tribes. This is when David, he, you know, was counting. He says, go now through the tribes of Israel from Dan, even to Bathsheba, and count the people that I may know the number. And then in 2 Samuel 24, 10 says, but David's heart was smote after he had numbered the people. That's what happened. David got conviction. He said, David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. I beseech you, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And that's why he was sitting there in his sackcloth with his others, you know, and, and lying out before God, crying out to him, you know, to, to change him, <coughs> to do the things, you know, that, that happened, you know, on that threshing floor, to, to make him into the person that he needs to be. In 2 Samuel, in 24, 18, 25, this is the story of the whole threshing floor. And then Gad, Gad was one of the prophets of David along with Nathan. And Gad came to David and said, go up, 
rear an altar of the Lord on the threshing floor. You know, and so David went up according to Gad's word as David commanded. Uh, the Jebusite looked and saw the king and the servants coming toward him. And he went out and bowed before the king and with, the face, with his face to the ground. The Jebusite said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy your threshing floor from you, to build there an altar of the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. He was coming before the Lord. You know, he knew. God told him. He says, and the Jebusite said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up what he seems to be good to him. Behold, here are the oxen for burnt sacrifice, the threshing instruments, and the yoke of the oxen for wood. And he says, oh, yes, yeah, oh, this, O oh, king, the Jebusite said to the king, and the Jebusite said to the king, the Lord, your God, accept it. But David said, no, I'll buy it for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, of which cost me nothing. For so David sought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings, peace offering. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the Israel's plague was stayed. They cried out to God. They were on their faces. They were in sackcloth. You know, they purchased that threshing floor. You know, they purchased it with, you know, their, their, their silver or their shekels. But truthfully, you know, we purchase it with our lives. We give our life and say, Jesus, take this. You know, I mean, you paid a price for us. You paid that price of those oxen that are being sacrificed there. You were the sacrifice for us. You know, when we lay on our threshing floors, we're, we're, we're crying out to God. We're asking those things to be removed. We want to be a new person. We want to serve God, you know, with the, we, we want to sow, as it says earlier, to righteousness. We want to be a ready listener, hear what God says, hear his instructions. We don't want the stiffened neck. We don't want the hardness of heart, the fallow ground that's in our lives. You know, when John the Baptist came in, in, in Matthew 3, 12, He's talking about Jesus coming because this is who he says his winnowing fan <clears throat> is in his hand. He's talking about Jesus coming and he will thoroughly clean out and clean his threshing floor and gather and store his wheat in his barn. But the chaff he will burn up and the fire that can and it, with the fire that cannot be put out. You know, that winnowing fan, it's used, like I said earlier, in, in the harvest. You know, and it's saying that's what, who Jesus is. He's the very winnowing fan in our lives. He takes us, he puts it up in the air, and he allows that chaff to be taken from us. You know, and, and that's who he is. That's who, who he is in our lives. You know, in Luke 22, 31 through 32, he says, he's talking to, uh, you know, this is at the, at the Last Supper. You know, and he says, Simon, Simon Peter, listen. Satan has excessively, you know, that all ask excessively all of you to be given up to him out of the power and the keeping of God. Just like Job, you know, that he's asking. He says that he might sift all of you like grain. You know, because when you sift the grain, you find out if what's pure and what's not. Because what's not pure is going to blow in the wind. But what's pure will fall back to the threshing floor. And it'll be the true, the true pureness of God. It'll be the gift, you know, that's left. He says, but I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your own faith may not fail. And when you yourselves are turned again, strengthened and established, you know, with your brethren. You know, and, and we know what happened with Peter. And he went on because he said, well, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, no, I'm not going to do that. But Peter denied him three times. But yet his face still stood. And in the end, he was there with his brother. You know, and Satan did sift him to see if all that was there in his life was not the real seed of God, but it was just simply the chaff. Because if it was the chaff, if our life is nothing but junk and all the things that we've taken on, you know, when Satan comes and sifts us, we're going to go. 
you know, we're going to go away over here. And what happens over there, you get burnt up. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not where we want to be. Deuteronomy 12, 5. He's, you know, he was, uh, David built that altar. He built it on the threshing floor. But it, there's an amazing thing in history to understand the threshing floor. Yes, because the threshing floor, you know, symbolically is what I just shared. But the threshing floor was a real thing. It, it, was, it was a place where David built an altar. But where he built that altar, in, you know, in Deuteronomy 12, 5, I read this verse. He says, but you shall seek the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his dwelling. There shall you come. You know, when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, he, he, he went to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah wasn't that whole area. Well, Mount Moriah is where David's threshing floor was. That was where his altar was. You know, and really, in the end, that threshing floor becomes a symbol of purification, a symbol of humility. Because those men, they were in sackcloth. They were on their face. They humbled themselves before God. And that's what the threshing floors of your life should become. When you fall down and you really let God deal with your life, and he begins to separate, and he begins to take away the things that you've given to. Those are really the purity. Those are the humility. That is the purification. You know, on that same threshing floor that David built his altar, Temple built, I'm sorry, Solomon built the temple. That's it. He built it on the same very place. It says in 2 Chronicles 3 1, he says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared to David his father in the place that David had appointed, in the place, in the threshing floor of the Jebusite. You know, it, it, God's amazing. You know, in, through that whole history, all the way back in Abraham, he started that place. Then through David, and then through his son. You know, it, it's it's a strength, and it's always symbolic. It's there. That in itself is not the strength, but it's symbolic of the strength of God. And so are the threshing floors of our lives. I know our church right now is building. You know, is building its a new sanctuary, and you know, it, you begin to understand. That that sanctuary is being built on the on the very threshing floors of people's lives, because they, they they've gave so much. You know our pastors. I mean the persecution that's come, the you know the, the challenging. You know, but yet God sees fit in the midst of all that persecution, in the midst of that purification and and that humbling to go on a threshing floor and build a sanctuary. And that's what we're doing right now. And, and, and it's, so, it's so incredible. You know, you begin to see it. And, and, and you, you think, you know, I, you know, I've been there 30 years, almost 30 years. And, and to watch it and, and to realize it just brings you into remembrance of all the places of where you've come. It brings you into remembrance of all those threshing floors of your lives. And here's a sanctuary. And that sanctuary is going to be built. And it's going to be built because more people are going to come. More people are going to get their lives dealt with. More people will have threshing the floor experiences. You know, and it's going to be incredible. And you know what else? It's going to be an altar to God. And in that altar of God, you know, we're going to bring the sacrifice of praise. We're going to bring the word of God. And it's going to be fruitful. And to see it, to know it's there, and to know it's coming... It's unbelievable. It's amazing. But I want to read this verse in closing because it's very important for all of you. It says in Matthew 13, 40, 43, Just as the darnel weeds resembling wheat is gathered and burnt with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will bring forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of offense. People by whom others are drawn into error and sin, and all who do iniquity and act wickedly, and will cast them from into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and wailing and grinding of teeth. 
Then will the righteous, those who are upright and right standing with God, shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let him who has ears hear and be listening and let him consider and perceive and understand by hearing. You need to become a ready listener. Thank you for letting me be here today. You can always come back here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8.30 and hear others or go to our website, wordoffaithfellowship.org. Again, be a ready listener. Don't be a wicked man.